Hi, I'm with you digitally again. Um, we're going to talk about Upper Paleolithic art today, and I'm going to give you sort of a background to it, both painted art and portable art. And then on Friday, what you're going to do is see a film called um, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, which takes you inside one of the uh, the inside the oldest painted cave in France or in in Europe called Chauvet Cave in southern France. Um, made a couple of years ago by the film was made a couple of years ago by Werner Herzog. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview. I'm at a conference in Canada, and I will be back on uh, in class on Monday. So before we talk about Upper Paleolithic art, this incredibly um, distant world from our own in this Upper Paleolithic European late Ice Age place, I want to talk about issues that are related to art. So thinking about art, interpreting art in general. So first thing, um, let's ask, is this art? And the answer is yes. This is officially art. I downloaded this lovely image from the website of the Museum of Modern Art. So someone paid a bunch of money to buy it and uh, store it or maybe display it in the museum. Is this art? The answer is, um, according to the artist, the person who drew it, no, this was drawn by my daughter when she was three, and it is not art, it is a map. It is a map from our house to the CU Daycare Center on Arapaho. Um, and I'm sure you can all see how to follow to get from one place to the other. Right? But the point of this is that the meaning is in the eye of the of the person who did it and the people they explain that to. That is, it's 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 symbolic in the real meaning of the term symbolic. That is, the association of image and meaning is arbitrary, and that is presumably always been true. And so, what that does is is put this huge interpretive weight on us. It makes it really difficult to sort these kinds of things out, especially in something as distant um, as Ice Age Europe which is what this is. And remember, this is the glacial period. This is very close to an Arctic desert for most of the of the Upper Paleolithic from, say, 25,000 years ago to about 12,000 years ago, close to the end of the Ice Age. Painted art um, is found in the southern part of France and throughout Spain. Almost in, It's almost entirely limited to that area. There's a little bit in Italy. Portable art is found all across Pale Upper Paleolithic Europe, and we'll talk about both of those things. But we're going to start with the painted art, which we'll refer to as parietal art. It's painted or molded on the floors of caves, sometimes traced in images and soft sediment on the cave walls, as opposed to portable art that was decorated objects that people carried from place to place. This is the kind of landscape that we find these cave zones. Talk a little bit about the context of these places. These dissected limestone plateaus in southern France and in Spain, where you get these deep, deep caves sort of um, eroded out inside. And there, this is an, um, an example of one of them. The cave opening is marked by that arrow. This one's right down on the coast of France. 25,000 years ago at Cascais, the sea level was much lower than it is today. Um, people found it actually by diving because the entrance to the cave is below the water table today. But you can see the water level today. You can see this long, long entrance back into this open cave. Um, it's a very dangerous place to dive into today. People die, die in there trying to swim in every year um, since the cave has been discovered. But it gives you a sense of how far in the, um, these places are. These are really remote. They're far back in what we call the dark zone in these caves, where there is no light. No light except the light that, that people carry in with them. Koske is a really good example of that. But it's true everywhere. And you know, these are not places people live. They're places they went to very, very infrequently. Um, we actually see footprints at many of them. There's footprints at Chauvet, and people have mapped them out to see if they can see things like dance patterns. I'm not sure that they have. Other caves like Peshmeral and Neo have also gotten footprints. Have, people have found footprints that date back 10, 20,000 years in many cases. There are also odd places for people to be because people were not the only people, the only creatures who were in there. Um, caves were occupied by, by other creatures, particularly by cave bears. This is the skull of a cave bear um, found at Chauvet Cave. And th there's no question that humans and, and bears overlapped inside these caves and that people knew that. Um, this is not the result of a cave bear falling over backwards and having hitting its head on the rock and having its head fall off and land like that. Somebody picked that up um, and placed it on top of that stone pillar. As people knew there were bears in there, and you can actually see bear claws scoring 
across painted um, images in these deep caves. So they're very remote places, um, potentially kind of dangerous places. Um, not much like going to church today. We much worry about getting eaten by large animals um, in church, but that had to have been a consideration back in the Paleo Upper Paleolithic Europe. So they're, they're deep under the ground, hundreds of meters in some cases. They are remote. Um, they're, they're not habitation places. They're places people went for some kind of special purposes. And they did this for tens of thousands of years. The oldest of these sites is Chauvet Cave. Um, at 32,000, there have been recently, um, there's a recent discovery of some painted rocks in Italy that go back perhaps 40,000 years, but Chauvet is certainly the best known. Um, so the oldest are about 32,000 years. The youngest are in the 13 to 15,000 year range. So for 20,000 years or more, people were systematically finding these special places and painting on the walls and doing something inside them. Over that huge span of time, we find some commonalities that the style of the art and the way that people used the cave changed, but it didn't change that much. So for example, you can see people using natural features of the cave and building these into the art. So at Lascaux, they use this dark staining on the bottom of the cave and the curve of the cave wall to give the impression of, of deer swimming across a river. So you can see their heads sort of sticking out as if they were um, swimming in water and you only can see their heads and necks. At Peshmarl, they actually use the curve of the stone to create the muzzle of a, of a spotted horse. And so this use, this, this, kind, of, this kind of incorporation of, of the rock itself into the images they were creating is quite common, as if the painting and the rock were one and the same thing. Perhaps this, the animal and the rock are the one and the same thing. You also find common images, particularly human hands, really stand out. Um, in these cases, you're seeing human hands held up against the rock with paint sprayed against them, probably through a tube um, in someone's mouth. You can also find um, sort of positive impressions. These are negative impressions of hands, positive impressions of hands that um, someone did, where someone dips their hand in the paint and puts it on the on the wall of the cave. So, you know, over over hundreds and thousands of square kilometers and tens of thousands of years, people kept these sort of stylistic um, habits and, and applied them in many, many places and many, many times. So there's a real continuity in this stuff. Um, we're going to talk about diversity um, too, but there is a unity to this art. What does it mean, right? Is that thing that my daughter drew a map or is it art? Um, the most common interpretation people have made uh, for many years is that it's some kind of hunting magic, that you're painting on the walls of these caves um, to get some kind of spiritual control over animals that you're then going to go out to kill and eat. And you do find animals um, that show up in archaeological sites, um, whose bones show up in archaeological sites, but there's sort of an opposite pattern to these. You find images on the walls very frequently, for example, of horses, uh, species that doesn't show up all that frequently in archaeological sites. That is kind of an inverse relationship between how often it looks like people ate these creatures and how often they painted them. This is a horse from Casquet. So, you know, it may just be that these animals were harder to catch or something, so you needed more magic, but it's really also clear, and Casquet illustrates this, that that they painted things that you probably didn't need a lot of mag magic to catch and that probably weren't very important in the diet. So Casquet has horses, Casquet has ox, you know, with these flightless seabirds that certainly didn't figure very prominently in the Paleolithic diet and that weren't very good at getting away. Um, you could just walk up and whack them in the head. Um, there's also paintings at Casquet that seem to be jellyfish. It's not obvious at all that you need magic to go hunt jellyfish. So, you know, the, the, it may be that people painted these things because they, they wanted to go out and get them for dinner, but it's hard to explain everything that way. We're going to see that it's hard to explain all of it in any one kind of idea. Um, a second idea that people have used is that that art, this this art and many other kinds of rock art, are kind of a memory of hallucinations that people had in trance states, trance states, um, and that also may have helped people to get into a trance state. And there's my typo for the day: trance states. Um, there are three stages of a trance. One is what, are, in the earliest stages, you have what are called entopic visions. You see dots and grids and zigzags and lines, and they seem to move. You'll see those, you know, the, if you have migraines, those of you who have migraines may see these kinds of things. Migraine artists kind of paint their memories of the images they saw and 
people think that these kinds of images on cave walls may be memories like that. If you push hard on your eyeballs, for example, you'll see things like this. Don't do that. It is bad for you. Um, but you'll see the same kinds of things because we all hallucinate in much the same way. In the second stage of a trance, we take those visual images, those hallucinations, and we give them meaning. We make them into things. We turn them into animals, or we turn them into trees, or we turn them into, into meaningful images in some way. And what we turn them into depends on sort of our cultural background and our sort of cultural expectations. As you go deeper into a trance, then you, what you see is these move, yourself moving through a tunnel surrounded by these swirling images. And you don't see them as hallucinations. You experience them absolutely as reality. Um, all humans who, who go into trance states go through these stages. It's a hardwired thing. It's, a, it's, a part, it's an aspect of our brain. And you can induce those trances in all kinds of ways. Pain, hallucinogens, fasting, long time in the a long time in the darkness, um, like the darkness in these caves, will produce hallucinations. Your brain does not like not having visual stimulus, and it will create visual stimulus for you. We see abstract kinds of signs. There's another one of those hands in this image, but there's just the spray of dots. And you can see those kinds of things, migraines. You can see those kinds of things in, in the first stage um, of a, of, a, of a trance state. And you see swirls of these things starting to form patterns in other cases. There's also these very abstracted kind of, of what people call spaghetti um, in soft sediment, just by, formed by tracing um, your fingers through these soft sediment, the mud on the walls and things like that. Um, at Chauvet, um, there's this collection of red dots that are actually individual handprints. You'll see something about this on the film on Friday. But each one of those dots is the print of a human hand with the fingers folded up. And that seems to be an animal, almost like an animal made of glowing red dots that, that we're, in, we're in the second stage of one of these trances. It took those, those images and made them sort of culturally meaningful, perhaps a bison, perhaps something else. So we see these things. And there is an argument that at least some caves, um, particularly Lascaux Cave, the most famous of these caves, um, may actually be interpretable in terms of those stages of trance. So that at Lascaux, what you see is a, a sort of a, a fairly large entryway. And the ancient entryway and the modern entryway seem to have been the same place. But then you've got these very long, narrow um, um, passages that go off from this entry. And it turns out that if you look at the, at the art that's around the entryway, there's animal images, but there's lots and lots of signs, these abstracted signs, almost like stage one kinds of, of um, images, dots and grids and things. But as you move into those, those narrow tunnels, the paintings kind of swirl around the walls and the, and the ceiling in a very chaotic kind of a way. They're, it's very confusing. It's hard to find constructed panels. Horses, for example, seem to fall down the wall, and um, bison sort of on the roof. And it looks very much like the stage two, maybe stage three kind of imagery, and almost as though it's been painted out of a memory of these trances by someone who then you know, set it up so that people could find trances like this and, um, as they came, as they came into the cave and stayed in the dark and then lit lights or something like that. So that works kind of for Lasco. It makes a good story and it, the story you know, fits what we know about that site reasonably well. It definitely doesn't work for everything else. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about Chauvet on Friday, so we're not going to talk about it much today. But look at the floor plan of this. It's big and broad and open, um, and there's lots of space inside. This is not a tunnel that you go down. It's a big, open, flat area, and there are footprints scattered across this. And the cave art in here is stunning. It is spectacularly done, but it is made to be seen, and it is extraordinarily realistic. This is one of the most amazing panels. This is a group um, of cave lions, and they are in perspective. I mean, this is a, a hunting pride of lions, and the, not only is the, the skill of the artist in creating a three-dimensional image uh, really breathtaking, look at that, that one in the upper right corner, um, but they've actually taken the time to scrape the cave wall away, create a white background that they can then put these black heads on, and they just jump off the wall. I mean, this is a panel that was meant to be seen um, meant to be seen over long periods of time. And that really suggests, you know, that, that there's an ex, a sort of an expectation of, of vision of this, um, not as a hallucination, but, but as a panel of cave lines. It tells you that there's something else going on in that cave than what we can... You, you could not do the kinds of things 
in Lascaux that you can do at, at uh, Chauvet. And we'll see something similar at Neo. Notice Chauvet is the oldest of the caves that we know about. Neo is one of the youngest. So this continuity spans thousands of years. Um, this is a map of the, the, the galleries at Neo. You can't go into Chauvet. Nobody gets into Chauvet, or almost nobody gets in. But you can visit Neo, and you'll come in an entrance on that upper left side that's artificial, but it's right by the initial entrance. And it's 500 meters down this narrow, this, well, it's not that narrow, it's easily walkable kind of tunnel to what's called the Salon Noir. And that's one of two entrances into this network of tunnels. There's another at the Réseau Class, or down at the bottom. Um, and you can travel hundreds of meters down that long corridor. Um, the orange spots are ponds, so you have to wade through water to get there. Um, but it's clear that people explored this entire network of caves and picked one place to do their paintings. Because in all of those hundreds of meters of tunnels, um, there's a handful of of paintings, but um, little signs here and there. But ninety percent of the paintings, and the, oh, and virtually all of the realistic paintings, are in one place, and that's the Salle Noire, which is in the center of this place. So they had to seek this place out and paint it. Um, as you get to the entrance to the to the long tunnel that leads down to the Salle Noire, there's actually a a large set of paintings right here. All these abstract signs, almost as if they're marking the entrance. And you come to see that, you know, you've got to turn left and head down the and head down on this other tunnel. That scratching is actually scratching on an old slide. It's not on the wall. This is the Salle Noir, and once again, this is a sort of orderly array of paintings around at eye level. The lower picture gives you a sense of scale. Those posts are about three or four feet tall just to keep people away from the walls. Um, so you get this high arched ceiling and these black images of horses and ibex and, and bison, and you can see there's spears kind of sticking into the bison, which is what people think of when they think of hunting magic. But, um, and maybe that's what it is. Um, but these these images are scattered around. There's more bison there. The French have actually done very careful kind of remote sensing, as in a sense, into b below the first layers of these, and they seem to be multiple layers of paint with um, calcite that's formed over them and obscured some of the earlier painted images as if these were painted and repainted over many years. And it turns out that sound mattered. It wasn't just the, the deep darkness, but that if you pick out that one place, you're picking out a place that has the, some, the same kinds of acoustical properties um, as a Romanesque chapel. That is, you can hear things more, and they're, they're amplified in a different way, and they're clearer in the Salle Noël than they are anywhere else in the cave. You can almost, you know, imagine people drumming as they're as people are walking towards this or chanting or something like that, which is, you know, our imagination. Um, we don't know that any of that happened, but it certainly could have. And when they, they make such a such a clear choice of where to paint, and it has these other properties as well, it really suggests that that whatever was going on there just didn't just involve these paintings flickering in the light of their torches, but also sounds and, and possibly sounds at a distance. So some of this stuff may be linked um, to trance states um, and other in sort of individual religious experience, but other art, maybe Chauvet, maybe Neo, sure looks like it's linked to something much more like an organized religious ceremony of some kind that involved multiple people. And all of it Every bit of this stuff is in these incredibly dangerous and inaccessible places. And it's not, you know, there's no cave bears in there today, but if you got in there and your lights went out, it would be essentially impossible to get out. Um, and that was had to have been more true 20,000 years ago without electrics, the lot of electricity and light bulbs and things like that and batteries. You know, they're going in there with fire and torches. And if those fizzled out, you know, they might be trapped in there forever. So this is really a place that is out of the ordinary. It's out of everyday life. And yet there's no question um, that they were seeking these places out, systematically exploring these caves, and then doing very special things in them. There are a couple of places where it looks like there was exterior art. Obviously, these paintings would not survive for 20,000 years in the open air. There are some engraved um, there are some places in Spain and France where it looks like there's open air engraved art, but they're very badly known and they're almost impossible to get an accurate date on. So they may or may not really be Upper Paleolithic. Those would have been much more out um, in the real in the daily world. Um, but we know that there was art in their daily lives, in people's daily lives, throughout all this time as well, because we find portable art. We find it throughout the same period that these things are being painted. 
um, and a lot of it is truly spectacular too, and it's also really diverse. So you often find it in a mortuary context. I mentioned Sungir when we were contrasting um, Upper Paleolithic and Middle Paleolithic or, or Neanderthal mortuary patterns, but Sungir is the spectacular case of, of carving and jewelry and, and things like that that must have been out in the daily world but, um, with these folks before they were interred. So Sungir produces things like this, these carved um, bone discs and, a, and a, an animal of some kind carved out of bone and these beads and things like that. Sungir itself produced about 10,000 beads and experiment estimates are that they took about an hour each to make. So my people are doing this kind of work and they're, and they're, have, they're, they're keeping these things around sort of visually. When you look at the themes, I mean beads and things like that aren't, don't, aren't, don't obviously have symbolic meaning or at least not anything that's obvious to us. But when you look at the things that do seem meaningful, the things that we can look at and say, you know, I know what that is, about 90% of the images um, are animals. And they occur both as kind of freestanding objects. You can see that bison with its head turned back in that upper right picture. There is a horse in the lower right. There's an elephant. And those are just images or, of these creatures. In other cases, they're actually adornments on tools. They're handles or, or, or hooks on atlatls, um, like that upper left-hand image, or carvings into, into the handles of tools and things like that. Um, but they are overwhelmingly animals, both on utilitarian items and just as decorative items in, in, um, on their own. And if we're going to take anything away with that, we should expect, if there's symbolic meaning in this, we should expect that that would tell us that, that animals played a really large role in their ideology, um, in their religious thought and belief, just as, um, as they did in the, in the deep caves where they were painted. But despite that, um, what people pay attention to are not well. The people pay. I, I, don't, I shouldn't say that. People pay attention to the the animals, but but in the certainly in the popular imagination and a lot of the archaeological imagination, what people pay attention to are the human um, figurines. And when they talk about the human figurines, they talk about one particular category of human figurines. And this is the most famous example of those. This is the Venus of Willendorf from Austria, about twenty five thousand years old, and um, these carved stone and, and bone images of large women have really occupied the archaeological imagination of Paleolithic portable art and the popular imagination. And they have, there is a set of these things that does share a fair amount of, in common. Um, here you can see in, in this case she's got this braided, what appears to be braided hairdo, she doesn't, which is covering her face entirely. She's kind of anonymous in that way. She's very, she is a, a large woman. Um, and an archaeologist, and I'm, when I say that, um, I am talking about male archaeologists, particularly male French archaeologists back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, I talk about these as sort of a, an idealized Paleolithic female, an erotic image. And the implication is that they're all made by men, um, and, that, and that the sort of ways that men think about these images today connect um, with the way people thought about these images in the deep past. And there is, you know, there is a lot of continuity in these. So the, the most recently discovered one is at Holofels from Germany, 35 to 40,000 years, right? And it shares a lot in common with the, that's in the upper left, it shares a lot in common with the Willendorf, um, with the Willendorf example. And you can see these carved examples that are sort of um, carved into the wall of caves, the two in the center and these freestanding ones um, from Malta in, in Siberia and from Kostenki in Russia. You know, and they're, again, they're sort of anonymous and they're big women. Um, so there is a continuity in all of this. Whether it, oh, and they're tiny. Um, they're often really tiny. We talk about portal. These are portable in a serious way. Um, they're just a couple of inches long. That's not the only people who were depicted, though. So if we're talking about idealized creatures, idealized people, I mean, there's more to it. There, um, there's more to the range of diversity of these things than just those women. They're men, not many, um, but there are definitely men. This is the most famous, and I showed you this before, from Hollenstein Stadel, 32,000 years ago, and got another ordination um, carving. This is of a, either a man, perhaps turning into a lion, and in, in, as part of a shamanic trance and vision state, or perhaps just wearing a lion's costume on his head. Um, 
But there's other there's alternative interpretations of these things. As I said, you know, male archaeologists have assumed that men carved them, for example, and they were meaningful to men. There's an argument that that's not true at all. You know, that if you look down, if a woman who's pregnant looks down at her body and carves this as an image of herself, you get some you get a result that's very much, for example, like Willendorf. So on the one side you see a woman looking what a woman sees down the side of her body and then down the side of the Venus, down her back and down the back of the Venus. You know, there's problems with this too. You would think a pregnant woman could look at other pregnant women and carve them. Um, but right, how do we ch how do we decide which which way is the best way to make meaning out of these? There's always multiple interpretations. You know, my daughter's picture is a map or it's art, you know, and it's in the, in her eye, not ours, and, and people who carve these are not us. The other thing is that there's lots and lots of obviously female figurines that aren't like the Venus of Willendorf. Um, they're not all big women. There's bodies that look young and bodies that look old. There are bodies that look thin and bodies that look heavy. There's a huge diversity. Um, one person sort of went through and tried to estimate body proportions and things like that and the ages of these different images and argued that, that if you look at them all together instead of just picking out the most famous ones, the most dramatic ones, you know, what we're seeing is a kind of a cross-section of female appearance in any kind of typical hunter-gatherer population, which suggests that they may not be male ideals of a particular image, but they may be representations of, of the kinds of people who were widespread in society, maybe even in some cases, and we'll get to a case like this, representations of particular people. We also bring a lot of our assumptions to sort of the interpretation of what constitutes, or the decision about what constitutes a Venus figurine. This is a really famous one, Brass and Poi, um, also in the 20,000 year range, one of several images that, that came out of one particular archaeological site, early 20th century. And it's always included with the Venus figurines. And there's a you know an artist's kind of depiction of, of the person, the, the woman who it might be an image of, and her you know hair maybe braided that way or something like that. And, and of course we know that it has to be a woman because guys never do anything like that with their hair, do they? Right? We don't cornrow our hair, except when we do. Um, there's nothing on that other image that tells us it's female at all, except the assumptions that we bring to looking at that image. Um, and if you did a an ivory statue of one of these guys that might look very much like that. There's also some serious leaps of interpretation because these have been classified as Venus figurines. Um, and I'm not, it's not obvious to me that the ones on the left are human images at all and that one on the right seems like it could have more than one gendered interpretation of what those things are, but you know, there could be a lot of things besides Venus figurines. So the point of all that, right, is that we see these representations and we know that they were in everyday life and there's regional differences. The ones that are, that are in France are not identical to the ones that are, that are up in, in Russia, um, even though they share certain kinds of continuities. So we can learn from them and we can see um, something about what people thought was important, but we don't see them through their own eyes. We don't, we don't know what they meant to those people. And then some of them may have been idealizations, um, some of them may have been portraits, and in one case we can be reasonably clear, um, reasonably sure, in fact, that they were portraits. And that's at the site of Dolne Vestonice in the Czech Republic, around 26,000. And Dolne Vestonice is a huge and amazing site that has produced incredible amounts, for example, of elephant bone, just astonishing quantities of elephant, of mammoth bone, um, and structures that were built out of mammoth bone. Um, carved bone beads and fox teeth necklaces and things like that, this, this very strange triple burial. These people interred, three bodies interred together in this odd position that people speculate about all the time. It's also um, produced that structure in the upper right, which is built sort of into a hill slope you can see it's got a rock ring that probably supported a shelter um, on one side, but in the center of it is is the oldest kiln, the oldest pottery kiln known in the world. Um, wasn't used to make pots, not containers. It was used to make images, including at least one Venus figurine out of clay and fired and fired into you know ceramic form. Also, lo lots and lots more images of animals. Um, this particular one is intact. What they typically did was make these things and then break them. Um, so it's an amazing site, but it also produced these. 
Um, what you're looking at are three images of two separate objects. The two on the left are just different views of one particular head, and the one on the right is a second um, image of a person's head. They are found in stratigraphically distinct layers of the site that are a couple of hundred years different in age. But what's weird about them is that if you look at them, the faces are asymmetric. That is, if you look at that one in the middle, you can see it really clearly. The mouth goes up on one side and down on the other, and, and the, the eye on your right is higher than the eye on your left. And actually, you see the same pattern on the one on the right that's 200 years later in age. And that's all the more remarkable, um, because Dolly Vestanice, out of that ceramic um, level, also produced the ochre stained burial of an older woman, a woman in her 50s. She was buried underneath two mammoth shoulder blades. Um, she was holding a fox. And when they looked at the muscle attachments on her face, the muscle attachments on one side of her face were very clear, and the ones on the other side of the face were almost invisible, which is what you get when you had a stroke, and you were paralyzed on one side of your face, which means her face drooped. She had exactly, exactly the same imagery as we see in those two carved images, exactly the same asymmetry, excuse me, that we see in those two carved images. And one of the things that that says um, is that despite the fact that there is nothing on those images that gives us biological sex, um, it's really hard not to believe that they're not pictures of her. And um, if that second one is 200 years older, younger than the other one, then people remembered her um, for a very, very long time. Um, it suggests that it's a portrait of a woman who played a major role in this society. So, what do we know? Um, interpretations of the meaning of Paleolithic art very often reflect our own modern ideas and values. Um, we cannot know that what, we're, that what these things say to us is the same thing that they said to other people. We can, you know, the experience of being in those caves, the visual impact of many of those, of those images um, certainly is something that, that we share in common with them. But, but to understand the, sim the, the exact symbolic meaning of those things for people 20 or 30,000 years ago is really, it's almost impossible to imagine that we can really do that. But we can still learn from them. Uh, we can still learn a lot about the societies that made them and the different contexts that they operated in. Both of the both the parietal, that is the painted and the portable art, are very diverse. There is no one interpretation that makes sense of them all. Um, they must have played multiple roles in society um, and in in bringing symbolic meaning into the into the daily lives of these people and into and bringing people into these very special places for for powerful um, in religious events. Um, they suggest that there were individual spiritual experiences were very important. Um, certainly that, that Levenmensch carved man suggests that individual, this, these visions of transformation may have been really important. Things like Lascaux suggest that individual trans states and visions may have been really important. But they also suggest that group rituals um, matter too. That, that people taking groups of people into these deep caves and, and doing something together really mattered. So they're, they're not just about individual spiritual experiences, but also community kinds of experiences. And that we can guess that they celebrated or commemorated both cultural ideals and perhaps specific individuals. Because art isn't one thing today, and it wasn't one thing 20 or 30,000 years ago either. But it, if there are a few things in the archaeological record that show us our humanity, that are shared humanity with these folks, as much as this stuff does. Okay. So, that's a quick overview, give you some ways to think about this stuff. On Friday, what you're going to do is be taken into Chauvet Cave in a movie, the best way we can, um, and get a sense of what the spaces were like, the physical space in there, what the art looks like, and also a, way, a sense of how people are studying it today, what modern archaeologists do. We don't have time to show the whole film. If you have Netflix and streaming, um, you can stream the, the whole movie, um, but we'll show you the part that, that concentrates on what's really in the cave and give you a sense of that. And then Monday, um, I'll be back and we will talk about people in the world beyond um, the mainland of Asia and Africa and Europe. So have a good rest of the week and I'll see you guys on Monday.